third day I was down on White Avenue in Edmonton, just at a coffee shop across the street from what is called Ride Corner, which as you can guess, is a part of the city that's well known for being a gathering place for the LGBT community. But it's also a place where you'll often have Christian fundamentalists like this gentleman show up with a sign and a microphone bellowing out sermons of stentorian judgment and warnings, uh, as well as punctuated references to the love and mercy of God to passerby and motorists. And that's what was happening the other day. So I snapped a picture of the gentleman. I'm going to say I'm sure there are good intentions woven in to uh, what he's doing here. But I think it's also a pretty toxic brew of theology and practice. But I didn't always think that. Back in the 1980s, when I was a kid growing up in a, a sort of a fundamentalist, conservative, Protestant tradition, I would have viewed somebody like this as being bold and admirable because Jesus had warned that if you are ashamed of him, then he will be ashamed of you when he returns. So that created a heady dose of fear and guilt every time we were ashamed to be adequately bold to the world around us as this gentleman was being here. And Jesus also said that the world will hate you because you are mine. And so the more that people here would, would swear at and curse and shout this preacher on the corner, that would be more evidence that he was in fact being a faithful witness to Jesus. Uh, and that therefore would be something that we should look forward to. I hope that you can see how, while there's an element of truth mixed in here, it's also a lot of error, which leads to toxicity. Because what it does is it provides a negative feedback loop that the more people are opposed by you and repelled by you, the more faithful you are, which happens to must be a pretty distorted understanding of the gospel and Christian discipleship, especially when Jesus so obviously was attractional in his life drawing people from the margins to him continually, whereas the people Jesus repelled were the religious insiders who were powerful hypocrites, not people existing on the margins of society. But how does fundamentalism look then to people who are not fundamentalists, that is to the rest of us? And I want to conclude by giving a quick illustration for how people like this gentleman looked at people outside of the fundamentalist community. Here is a video posted online just in the last few days of some uh, climate activists throwing cans of soup onto oil paintings. I think it's a Van Gogh painting and protesting some of their friends who were put in prison for doing precisely the same thing. And I know these people are well-intentioned. At least there are some well good intentions mixed in with it all. Uh, but for the rest of us, these look like... Uh, not people who are courageous, not people who are bold, not people who particularly care about the environment, but rather publicity-seeking vandals who end up alienating people from the very cause they want to draw us to. This is not a tractional apologetic witness for the climate activist community or the environmental community. This is a way of repelling people from the very interests that they profess to want to draw us to. And they could have the same logic as the Christian fundamentalist that say, well, we've done our business and the more that people are repelled by us, the better we are doing our job. But it's the exact same thing. The way that most of us would be disgusted by these acts of vandalism as a response to protesting climate change and the consumption of oil. So many people are repelled by the preacher on the street corner who bellows at people God's coming stentorian judgment in a way that, that doesn't draw people to Christ in the way that Christ, in fact, drew people to himself. And so this is the way I believe that Christian fundamentalists are viewed by the rest of us.